we touched on a question uh, a moment ago, the question of energy. Now, I, I know that uh, recently you said, Dr. Mead, that you did not think the world needed a nuclear e or a plutonium economy at all. And there seems to be a big debate going on. Uh, uh, it's taking a form of a moral debate on the question of energy, whether in fact we need nuclear power, whether we need the plutonium economy, or whether natural energy, solar energy, or something like this can take over well, from fossil fuel before the end the of the century. It depends on the time scale again, you see. There isn't any argument at the moment that France can put up a very good argument for needing nuclear power, or that Japan can. And if in particular nation states, in terms of their economic needs, or maybe their prestige needs in many cases, insist on spreading the breeder and on a totally new form of use of nuclear power, with plutonium being carted around the world in large m amounts, our problem changes from the problem of deterrence when the Russians and ourselves at least could watch each other while we escalated and escalated and escalated the amount of nuclear uh, weapons that we had. So we've got a new problem now. now. And the arguments for particular countries right now, which does not include the United States and does not include Brazil, that doesn't need a breeder at all, um, are quite different. And people, of course, who the commercial companies who want to make a great deal of money out of breeders because uh, we, the taxpayers pay for it and they don't, so of course they can make a lot of money, try to promote nuclear power. And the military, whose business it is to be as bright and innovative as possible and think the worst about everything, they promote new technology, which they should. And it's a question of whether there's going to be enough citizenship power to say we must protect yeah. the future. Let me uh, make two comments there. I agree with almost everything you said, except the, it's not the commercial people pushing the beta reactor, it's the nationalists in various countries. You don't need in beta reactors. In this country? No, in this country, uh, and it's, it's a weak point. But we're selling them. No, no, we're not selling beta reactors anymore. Right now we're not, but uh, we will if we're, we're not, not careful. No, we're, we're the outstanding group against it. We're the big pressure group against it. Right now. Uh, right now. Uh, I myself, uh, when I started the Annals of Peace program, I thought that was a mistake. Uh, the world, there's plenty of coal in the world. You don't need nuclear, nuclear uh, reactors. Now, it's true, uh, for, if you're going to use coal, then you're going to depend upon importation. Yeah. You know, you know I mean, uh, but in, back in the uh, Eisenhower days, I just thought we were going to go for coal. Push coal as hard as you can push it. Uh, it's dirty, it's ugly, it's accident prone, people get killed, it has, gives, gives you pollution, it's better. <laughs> you know, in the, as the intermediate thing. Eventually, yeah. you go to solar or to yeah. geothermal you know, or something like that. Uh, a couple of years ago, I would have told you the, the barn door is open and you can't stop it. I've sort of changed my mind. To my, to my surprise, uh, the anti-nuclear movement has a much greater strength than I've expected, partly for irrational, irrational mm -hmm. but yeah. that doesn't improve, that doesn't mm. change the strength of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would not surprise me completely, that's a careful statement, uh, if we couldn't stop things like the plutonium economy and the beta reactor. And I would think it'd be a very good thing to stop. You know, I mean, yeah, words, that's, uh, that's what I hope, that we uh, can uh, stop it. One of the other problems with the plutonium economy is if you count in all the amount of the salaries of all the policemen who have to be maintained to protect the sources from terrorism, you end up with a kind of society that begins to be like a modern airport. And so that you, you get this polarization of a supermanaged society uh, uh, and unmanageable uh, uh, terrorists. I think you... And you never factor in the cost of all those no, salaries in terms of net uh, energy theory. No, no, we, people look at the safeguarding costs are not that, that big in the sense of people look at it. But the moral safeguards. hazards are very great. The moral hazards are great, and furthermore, they may not bother safeguarding. Not because it's too expensive, yeah. but because it's bureaucracy, they don't want the extra 500 guards and this kind of stuff. And more important, you don't trust the government. <laughs> I mean, you know, it is, it's not just the terrorists you don't trust, it's the government you don't yeah. trust. You see. Uh, well, I was thinking the issue of terrorism well. may be terribly important. You may end up with a semi-police state because of the terrorist problems. But it isn't the nuclear specifically that creates that terrorist problem. No. It's a very general problem. The uh, uh, no, I think uh, the United States uh, made a very bad choice back with the Honest Peace Program. We're trying to reverse it today. Is you it know. reversible? If you asked me two years ago, I told you what I told you. Absolutely not. I'm not sure today.
Now, some of the other problems that people are worrying about today, uh, there's a lot of concern among scientists, for example, uh, about the research that's being done into recombining the DNA molecule, this uh, genetic engineering. Uh, genetic engineering, I think, is a pure red herring. There's a de possibility of doing any genetic engineering that would matter is very low, but we're doing experimentation on genetic engineering that is very dangerous. We're letting people irresponsibly use material for experimentation, which might be very destructive, and people are mixing it up. But most of the time, when you hear people talk about genetic engineering, you know they don't want to talk about pollution, and they don't want to talk about taxation, and they don't want to talk about food, and instead you have a lovely moral issue about genetic engineering, and they ignore all the things that matter, like what might be happening to the ozone layer now, not, 20, not 50 years from now. You know, I don't want to put it the other way. The ozone layer issue is quite a serious issue, in, but in the following sense. Say you damage the ozone layer, the people are worrying about it. You would create a kind of a same risk you have in going to Colorado Springs or going to the beach one day. Oh, look, Harmon, yeah. you know, that argument I'm very, very tired of, and I've just uh, been to Colorado, and I don't like it there. No, but I'm saying it's an important point. People thought that the ozone layer uh, the, was, was, was being risked in the sense of kind of a world annihilation. I'm not saying, by the way, you can't risk the ozone layer. It's a delicate thing, and there are things we and may you do. You could risk it. I'm not going to one bit. But I'm saying, but the kind of hysteria that came up with the uh, uh, aerosols and so on mm -hmm. was talking about a very trivial effect. I mean, trivial. Maybe. And no, no, maybe, and we don't know for certain, and there are a great many people we, who we don't know. know that we don't know what the thresholds are. We don't know what the thresholds no, are no, for no, any no, of these no, things. No, Years we, ago, we they have We have no good deal of the threshold for sunlight. We know whether people no, get sun or not. No, we don't know the impact of technology. Years ago, I people were correct. cured for cancer with giving x-ray therapy. Now they have to call them back and say, you're likely to get cancer of the thyroid from the x-ray treatments you were given. The x-ray treatments you're given also cause deterioration of the, of the teeth and all kinds of things because we continually look at the world and the human body as a machine with industrial metaphors for it rather than e ecological or symbiotic. And we don't understand if you stick in something here, you're gonna get a problem over here. And most planners like yourself don't think in that I, symbiotic I you, kind of term. I beg your pardon, just exactly opposite is true. None of us ever say we, we're designing our future. We don't keep think that's how it can be done. We know we're, we're making our future, we're not designing it. But you're designing we, uh, it to the extent that you say there are irrevocable trends. That is design. I'm not yeah. saying, I don't think there's necessarily quote irrevocable trends. I think there's certain trends with enormous momentum. Yes. Very hard to change. And to that extent, and you're I mean, designing. No, and I mean, I want to change them. See, in other words, there are many trends which I find that my colleagues in my own sort of social economic class uh, think I was awful. But when I go and talk to people, they like them. I, the most biggest shock in Australia, for example, was Australia was trying to go to streetcar cities when I first visited it. Somebody had been talking there. Australia, unlimited space, was thinking in terms of streetcar cities. Now, oh, come on. How, how, what kind of nonsense can you get? That was total nonsense. In, have you been in Sydney recently? Yeah, you're going to get... Look, smog is a temporary phenomenon. By the end of the century, you're going to have pollution-free cars. Uh, uh, I don't know whether it will be electrical. It improve the traffic if you can't get from one side of the city to the traffic other. Traffic problems, depending upon how you design it, the city may or may not be a problem. Cities designed in the, in the 50s will have traffic problems. Arizona has very few traffic problems in places like, like Tucson, Phoenix or uh, Tucson, because they're designed for the automobile. You know. the, uh, no, but take, take, for example, the food issue. Uh, you know, there's a surplus of food in the world today. We're cutting back acres 20% oh, You mean we can't sell our wheat, and so we're going to cut down on wheat when... 40% of the world is undernourished. Look, That's you're, you're putting the point wicked. exactly correct, which is the following point. There is no food problem if you tell me who's going to pay for it. That's right. For it, and as long as you, you think that food's about money and not about people eating. I'm sorry. That's what you're saying, Harvey. Yes, I'm saying that I am saying that, that, there, that I cannot feed the poor unless I can pay for it. That's right. Got now, I, may give, I am perfectly willing to give him charity. I'd be delighted to see U.S. aid programs doubled if it was productive. One of the things that I noticed was that a PL480 program wrecked agriculture in a number of countries. Again, you talk about you know, people with the best will of the world, plus the, uh, two people got together. The farmers want to grow their surpluses, and other people with the best will. And they sent free food all over the world, and it wrecked the farmers. There well, isn't a food surplus. The people who didn't think so keep, think that food is meant to eat, no. and your food surplus no, is in, only for pain. In 1975, there was enough food to feed everybody who could pay for it. And furthermore, if you gave me the money, you could fed all the people who hungry in 75 in so-called food service. And 18 shortage. days food reserve. Yeah, no, 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 all no. The but that's food reserve because, uh, again, it's a commercial issue. Look. That wasn't a commercial issue. That was an actual quantitative 
analysis. No, no, I'm saying it then pay, it doesn't pay to stockpile food. If you had told people that the price of food was going to double in 76, let me tell you what had more than 18-day supply. Speculators would have bought up all over the place. Well, look, let's try and understand one another. Here's where I disagree with you and where I'm trying to get at the point that what has created the Los Angelization of the planet that forces Sydney into smog and Tehran into smog and the Saudi Arabians into flush toilets in the desert is a particular kind of symbol system that's been packaged and exported by us by bringing their elites to our university and training them in terms of policy and programming and merchandising and the Harvard Business School kind of mentality. Now, the, the difficulty I find with your thought is I think it contributes to the runaway uh, feedback situation, positive feedback situation, in the sense that it becomes an apology for the rapid industrialization of the planet. You present a rosy picture of 15 billion people all earning $20,000 a year and saying there are no problems. But when I look at food, this is, this, let me finish the food thing. Okay. Don't say I said there are no problems. We, we filled the book with problems, but otherwise go on. Okay. Now, <laughs> if, we take, if we take food and we take like the, uh, um, the book on agriculture called The Unsettling of America by Wendell Berry, which is an analysis of agribusiness and a very critical analysis of it, we take an ordinary farmer, we, he gets way into debt and mortgage because he has to have high-tech kind of things. They compact the soil even further, so he has to have more machinery to deal with the compacting of the soil. He goes further into debt. We get the cycle where he pays trucks to come in burning fossil fuel to haul, haul his manure away and get rid of it, rather than using biogas methane generators. Why? Because he feels he's a hick. And if he deals with manure like his pappy, he's not an agribusiness like that city slicker from Shell and Monsanto. He wants to be a city slicker. He wants to be a businessman. He wants to be an industrialist because of that status system. And therefore, at every irrational level, he makes romantic, mythological, and irrational choices that you say are scientific and industrial Farmers and do management. Not in America. If you, if, you, if you told me that worldwide there is this kind of mythic irrationality, you attempt to copy America. The Green Revolution copied, is a perfect right? example in India. It was a, a nightmare. It was not a nightmare. It was a great success. India today has a food surface and they're shipping it out. They, should, they paid back uh, in Russia. I mean, I mean and the rich have got richer and the poor got poor in Calcutta and That's Bombay. That's not correct. Are, are the rich got richer and, and about half the poor got richer and half the poor stayed the same. You see, this is the difference and in perception uh, reality. I go to Calcutta or Bombay and I see hell. You see marvelous things. One person crosses the ocean and sees marvelous No, oil well, I see both things. Look, let me give, let's take a picture of India because this is a kind of a touchstone how you look at these things. I, I was in India for about, about three weeks. I gave a standard lecture there. You're doing quite well by my standards, but not as well as you'd like. What do you mean, they said? Well, I said 20% are in the modern sector, really going up fast. 40% are in a semi-modern sector. All those bullet carts got ball bearings in them now. They're getting rubber tires, which doubles and triples their life and usefulness. 40% are standing still or even moving back slightly. Yeah, okay. Now, this is the North-South Italy problem. Remember, North Italy went looming up and South just stayed there. This is the Brazil problem. Northeast Brazil just sits there and 50 million people in South Brazil move up rapidly. Okay. Meanwhile, the water table is lowering in the Punjab, and they predict a dust bowl for them because of Look, I'm rapid sorry, I'm irrigation. I'm sorry. Read Roger Avell on this thing. He's not uh, my side of the house on many of these issues. He's, just, he's, he's analyzed the food. India has become one of the major food exporters in the world with proper water management and a reasonable amount of investment. There's no You're there's looking at too narrow a time scale. I'm not looking at time scale. So. I'm looking at the rest of history. At, Roger's the rest of history. Too they narrow of the uh, and by the way, food is, uh, I'll make another comment, by the way. Uh, if any, it's not, it's not going to be a problem, say, 100 years from now, it'll be food. Because there'll be dozens of ways to produce it, which have nothing to do